Hello and welcome to my CCMP version 8 Enterprise Core Networking Lecture Review. My name is Arthur Solman and I'm going to be providing you lecture material for the Encore 350-401 exam. So this is going to be several video lectures covering the individual modules or lessons for the CCMP material. So let's jump in and let's see what we can do. Chapter 13, Multicasting. In this module, we're going to be looking at multicast fundamentals, multicast addressing for both how it operates at layer 2 and layer 3, and we're going to talk about the IGMP-based protocols. So we're going to also look at kind of the security portion of it. That way we can describe the flooding that it may be doing and prevention methods for using things like IGMP-based snooping. We're also going to be looking at protocol independent of multicasting. So that will be describing the concepts of PIM. And then we're going to be talking about the purposes and functions for uh, rendervising uh, points in a multicast based network. So let's go and let's jump on in uh, with multicast fundamentals. So what is multicast? So multicast is a technology that aids in optimizing the bandwidth utilization and it also allows us to conserve system resources. It also allows us to communicate with groups of resources based off of, of a specific multicast type address. For example, maybe we want to communicate to all OSPF based routers or maybe we want to communicate with all IPv6 based routers. Things like that allow us to use multicast in such a way where we can do group communication. So how does this work? It relies on IGMP or Internet Group Management Protocol for its operations in both layer 2 and within layer 3. So again, the protocol independent multicast, PIM, that is what is used for layer 3. IGMP is for layer 2. So as we uh, get into this, here we have our architecture. So for our layer 2, we're going to have things like a traditional switch, and we may even have some form of LAN connectivity between our devices, our switch, and the LAN port. Let me grab my pen real quick. So from this interface to this PC, this is our LAN. So that will be our, la uh, our layer two segment. So in that area, this is where we're using our IGMP. If we want to deal with any of this, what we could do is use an IGMP snooper that way we can prevent some of the security concerns within our multicasting. You're also going to notice at this interface, our default gateway, our LAN connectivity, however you want to refer to it, that is our IGMP querier. That is going to be the LAN facing interface. So again, this is a generic diagram identifying how IGMP operates between the difference between the local receivers and the local multicast routers at layer 2. That's what we discussed at first. We're also going to talk about the PIM, the layer 3 portion. These two technologies go hand in hand to allow multicast traffic to flow from source to receivers. So again, between our different layer 3 devices, layer 3, that's all going to be our HIM. Up here is our multicast source, and down here will be our receiver. In this way, we're, we're kind of going down to the network. So our multi -car, uh, multicast source could be a device, could be some media, could, could be lots of different areas that will stream either uh, UDP or RTP and from there 
go down to our layer 3. Our layer 3 will go down to our LAN. Our LAN will then filter it down to our receivers, which in this device would be our end devices, like a laptop or something like that. In traditional type IP communications, when you first take your courses, you look at unicast, broadcast, multicast. Unicast one to one, broadcast one to everyone, but again that multicast is one to many or one to a group. So let's look at our unicast one to one. So here we have a unicast video feed. We have a video server streaming multiple sessions of videos. Again, each device is going to have its own session stream to that. So again, we have six workstations are all watching the same video that's advertised by a server using a unicast traffic, a one-to-one. -one. So in this example, each of the arrows represents a separate session. So let me grab my pen. Mm. Sorry about that, it wasn't working. So again, each one of these are separate session streams. It's one video series, it's one video, one content, but we have multiple sessions. So if each stream is 10 uh, megabits, we now have five streams going so five times 10 megabits that means our connection have to be minimum 50 megabits now again modern day networks may not have that big of an issue with this type of speed but several years ago this especially this being might be some type of ISP might have a cost issue. Now, as we're doing this, so this is 50, this is 50, this is going to be 20 megabits, little b. This needs 30 megabits per second. So again, that sets up our hosts portion for our connectivity speeds. Well, what happens if we opted to broadcast the video instead? So in this figure, this is the same video feed. However, this time, we are not doing individual sessions. We are broadcasting it to everyone. So the same video stream will only consume 10 megabits of overall bandwidth. It's one stream going to everyone. But again, what happens if we don't want this going to everyone? Maybe we want this going to just a select group of people. So in this example, Workstation F doesn't want it. So they're just discarding the packets. That could be a disadvantage. Uh, it, we could actually be forcing more information than what the devices could handle. Again, maybe they don't want it. Maybe they're over being, uh, overloading, overtaxing it. So we may have devices that may not want it or may not be able to use it. So we're wasting resources. That is where our multicast comes in. Our multicasts, one to a group, while F still doesn't want it, our NIC at our workstation F will actually discard it at layer two. So again, workstation F would not receive any multicast traffic if the switch for that network segment enabled things like IGMP snooping which is covered in a, a little bit later section, but our devices could say, hey, this isn't for me, don't send it to me. And that is one of the benefits of using multicast. So instead of having to use all the excess bandwidth, we could actually 
send it to everyone, lowering our bandwidth costs, and having our layer 2 information, our layer 2 switches, using IGMP to discard the information before it actually even gets to our end devices, or if it does get to our end device, our end device would drop it at the NIC level without the workstation having to process that information. So again, when we're talking about this, that's because multicast provides one to many communication. The many is really depending on what needs it. So where only one data packet is sent on a link as necessary, it is then replicated between the links as the data forks or splits. This is a, a basically along the multicast distribution tree or MTD. The data packets are also known as a stream that uses a specific, specif a specific destination IP address known as the group address. A server for a stream will still manage only one session. However, the network devices selectively request to receive the stream or not to receive the stream. Recipient devices of a multicast stream are known as receivers. So again, recipient devices, devices that want to receive it, are the receivers. Common applications could be telepresence, a real-time video, IPV, uh, IPTV, stock tickers, uh, some type of DE, video conferencing, music on hold, gaming, a lot of other things. So the question then becomes, what are these multicast based addresses? If you remember your class A, class B, class C, you will notice class D is one that you normally don't ever touch. That's because that is the 24.0.0 slash four. That is going to be a class D range. So that's 224.0.0.0 through 239.255.255.255. The first four bits, 1110, gives us this giant range of addresses. These are set aside for multicast addressing for IPv4. Yes, there are IPv6 multicast addressing, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we need for this module. So let's review some of these guys. So here we have our local network control block. We have an ad hoc block. We have a reserved block. We have several uh, SDPs or SAP blocks. We have a ad hoc block three. Uh, we have an administrative scope block and so forth. So again, out of the multicast blocks, this is more of the uh, table of the important addresses. Not an exhaustive list, but a common one. Local network control block is a 224.0.0.0 slash 24. Addresses in this block are used for protocol control traffic, not forwarded out of a broadcast domain. Where the 224.0.1.0 slash 24 is for internet work control blocks. Well-known reserved multicast addresses are things like all OSPF routers, 224.0.0.5, all OSPF, uh, OSPF DR type routers, or RIP, or PIM, or VRP, or HSRP V2, or even GLBP protocols. All of these have specific multicast addresses, so you can quickly identify and communicate with all of the specific types of devices along the network. So if I want to communicate with all OSPF routers, I would send that to the destination 224.0.0.5. That would then send it to everyone. So again, when we're looking at this list, we can see where things are. If we want to hit up all NTP. So the administrative scope, things like the 
239000/8 they are described in the RFC 2365 they're limited to a local group similar to a TIN network IANA will not assign them so there are addresses out there that are there that aren't uh, allowed to be used by outside equipment. They're more internal only. So here we have our layer two multicast address. Every multicast address, IP address, will be mapped to a sp uh, specific and specialized MAC address. Again, building with layer two and layer three. This address will allow the internet, the ethernet interface to identify multicast packets specifically to a group. The network, the LAN, will have multiple streams and receivers known for which traffic to send to the processor. And that all is based off the MAC address. The MAC address will be assigned to multicast traffic. Meaning, the first 24 bits of multicast MAC addresses will start with 01005E. The lower order bits of the first byte is the individual group. And this is also known as the unicast multicast bit. When it's set to 1, it will indicate that there is a multicast frame. And the 25th bit is always set to 0. A lot of detail with this, but we do have an example. The lower 23 bits of the multicast MAC are copied from the lower 24 bit of the multicast group IP address. Here is an example. So within this layer 2 multicast based address, so let's review this again. The first 25 bits are always fixed. We, we know that. Always fixed. The last 24 bits, because again, MAC addresses are 48 bits. So 25 and 23 equals 48 bits. So that does hold true. Get all that erased. The last 24 bits are copied directly from the multicast IP address, and that will vary. Out of the 9 bits from the multicast IP address that are not copied into the multicast MAC address will be the higher order bits of 1110 as they are fixed. That leaves five bits that are varied that are not transferable into the MAC address. For most network engineers, this is more theoretical. So kind of just keep that in mind. So if we look at the multicast address 239.255.1.1, here is our 239, 255, 1 and 1. So that means the first 9 bits are not copied over. The higher order bits, the first 4, are fixed. That leaves these 9. that are varied, that are not transferred into the MAC. The rest of them, remaining 23 bits, are. So because of this, there are 32 or 25 multicast IP addresses that are not universally unique and could correspond to a single MAC address, i.e. there could be some overlapping, if this is a concern. So let's examine this overlap a little bit more. So here we have 239, 225, 1.1, 1 
to and another address 239.127.1.1. So again, we take our MAC address. The first 25 bits are fixed. The remaining 23 bits are not, but you'll notice 239.225.11.239.127.11 yield the same lower 23 bits. So again, this is something that we need to be mindful of. Not that I've encountered this to be an issue, it's just sometimes this does cause an overlapping MAC address, and that's something that you just need to be aware of. So let's move past this. Let's talk about our IGMP. The IGMP is the protocol that receives that receivers will use to join the multicast group. Normally, we're going to be talking about our layer 2 information. When a receiver wants to join a specific multicast feed, it will send an IGMP join request using the multicast IP group address for that feed. Let's say we want to join a IPV, uh, sorry, a OSPF router group. We will send the appropriate join message to that group. So, the receiver will reprogram its interface to accept the multicast MAC group address that will correlate to the group's address. For example, a PC could send a join request to 239.225.1.1 and then it would reprogram its NIC to receive layer 2 data from MAC address 01005E7F0101. Again, that MAC address is first 25 bits are set, remaining 23 bits are taken from that IP address. That way, the NIC will respond to its primary IP address and it's now listening for an additional MAC and IP address. That way, if someone either hits the primary IP address of a NIC or its multicast address, then it will respond to both. IGMP must be supported by the receiver and the router's interfaces facing the receivers. Again, modern day equipment shouldn't be an issue, but it might. There are a few different versions of IGMP. RFC 1112 will define IGMP v1 which is an older, more rarely used, but there's also RFC 2236 that uh, defines IGMP v2. Again, a little more common than uh, version 1, but it's still really dated. Then we have our RFC 3376, which sets up our IGMP v3, and this is used only IGMP v2 and v3 should be used, 3 being the better option, but 2 being a option. And we are only going to be talking about IGMP v2 and IGMP v3. Version 1 is outdated and it is dated. So if you are seeing it, you may want to reevaluate how the network is running and get at least certain services and infrastructure updated. So what does the message look like? Here is a example of a message for version two. So we have our 32 bit header, eight bits for type. We have eight bits for our max response. We have a 16 bit checksum and then we have our group address. So messages are sent with the IP route alert option set. So again, the alert option needs to be set. This will indicate that the packet should be examined more closely and a TTL of one. <clears throat> INGP packets are sent with a TTL of one. Again, that's a pretty common test question that I see so that packets are processed by the local router and not forwarded onward. So, 
again going through the different methods, um, sorry, different fields for this message. There are five types of IGMP messages used by routers as well as receivers. So we have a version two membership report, a version one membership report, a version two leave group, a general query membership query, and a group specific query. And again, the hex values, the membership report for V2 is a value of 16 in hexadecimal. Version one membership report is value 12 in hexadecimal. A leave group is value 17. General membership query is a hex value of 11. And a group specific query is a hex value of 11 also. So let's look at these. With the version two membership report, we're looking at the message type is referred to as the join message used by receivers to join a multicast group as well as to respond to local router membership queries. Member uh, ship version one is used by receivers for backwards compatibility. The version two leave group is used by receivers to indicate that they want to stop receiving multicast traffic that they've previously joined. Membership queries, again, type value, hex value 11, is periodically sent to all hosts, groups, addresses. That will be the unicast address 24, or sorry, 224.0.0.1 to see whether there are any receivers in that attached network. It sets the group address field to 0.0.0.0. .0. We also have a, a group specific query, also set to hex value 11. This is sent in response to leaving a group message to the group address and the receiver requests to leave. The group address is the destination IP address of the packet and the group address field. So these are some of the areas. So what about other fields? We also have things like our max response time, our checksum, and our group address. A uh, max response time is also hex value zero, sorry, hex value 11, zero x one one. It specifies the maximum allowed time before sending a response, reporting in a unit of a one tenth of a second. And all other messages are set to hex value zero. Checksum, this is a 16 bit ones complement of the ones complement sum of the IMG messages. This is a standard checksum. Group address, this is where the field is set to quad zeros in a general query message and is set to the group address in group specific messages. Basically, membership report messages will carry the address of the group being reported in this field. So let's look at the messages a little bit more in depth. So when a receiver wants to receive a multicast stream, it has to send a join. So it will send an unsolicited membership report, commonly referred to as the IGMP join, to the local router around it. Again, that's why the TTL is one. The local router will then send this request upstream towards the source using a PIM. This PIM will be a, a join message. When the local router starts receiving multicast streams, it will forward the stream to the downstream items to that subnet. The router then starts periodically sending general membership query messages into the subnet to all the hosts with the group address one or 224.001 to see whether any members are in the attached subnet the general query message will contain a max response time of 10 seconds. In the response to this query, receivers will set an internal random timer between 0 and 10. When the timer expires, the receivers will send membership reports, i.e. the join messages, for each group they belong to. If a receiver receives another uh, receiver's report, i.e. another join message, 
for one of the groups it belongs to while it has a timer running, it stops the timer for a specific group and then doesn't send a report or a join group to that. This is meant to suppress duplicate reports. Basically at this point, as they're going through the timer, they're not going to be trying to join multiple groups of the exact same group that they've already joined. They're going to space them out and stop sending join messages until they need to actually join again. Here we have our version 2 messages. When, uh, again, continuation of our version 2 messages. When the receiver wants to leave the group, it was the last receiver to respond to a query. It will send a leave group message to all router groups 224002. Otherwise, it can leave quietly because there must be another receiver in that subnet. So if it's as long as there is one additional receiver in the subnet, it's a quiet leave. Otherwise, it's sending it to an all router group 224002. When leaving the group the message is received by the local router it will follow with a specific membership query to the group multicast address to determine whether there are any receivers interested in the group remaining in that subnet i.e is there at least one additional end device and if there are no other end devices then the router will remove the igmp state for that group if there is more than one router in the lag segment, the IGMP query will do an election that will take place to determine which router will be the querier. IGMP v2 routers will send the general membership queries to all of their interfaces as the source IP address and destined to the multicast address 224001. When IGMP routers receive such a message, it will check the source address and compare it to its own interface. If the routers with the lowest interface IP address is in the LAN subnet, it will be elected as the IGMP querier. Again, these are all for version 2. Again, this module focuses on uh, version 2 and version 3. So, with version 3, we have to look at what version 2 did. So in version 2, we had a receiver send a membership report to join the, the group. It doesn't specify which source it would like to receive multicast traffic from. However, IGP, IGMPv3, mouthful, adds support for multicast source filtering, giving the receivers the capability to pick the source they wish to accept the multicast traffic from. All IPv3 IGMPv3 will support all IGMPv2 IGMP message types and is backwards compatible. But 3 adds in several new fields. These message types are called version 3 membership reports to support source filtering. The filtering includes two modes, include mode or exclude mode. Include mode, the receiver will announce memberships to a multicast group address and provide a list of source addresses, the included list from which it wants to receive information. The exclude list, the receiver will announce membership to a multicast group address and provide a list of source addresses that they don't want to get information from. So there are some differences that are important. The include list or the lists, both include and exclude, are important. So IGMP snooping basically allows, when we're looking at multicast traffic, the MAC address is never used as the source MAC address. So switches will treat multicast MAC addresses as unknown frames and flood them out all ports. All workstations will then process these frames. It is up to the workstations to select interested frames to process and which one should be discarded. The flooding of multicast traffic to a switch does waste bandwidth utilization on each segment. 
Cisco switches have two methods for reducing this type of flooding. IGMP snooping and static MAC address entries. Reality, you're not going to be using static MAC address entries. You should be looking at IGMP snooping tools to minimize the MAC address flooding of multicast information. So let's look at IGMP snooping a little bit more in depth. So in this example, IGMP snooping defined by RFC 4541, it's the most widely used method for examining our IGMP joins sent by the receivers to our local router and is maintaining a table of interfaces to the IGMP joins. So when we are looking at this, we can look at and examine our switch MAC address table. We can see the interfaces and we can also see the switch MAC addresses or the, the MAC address table for the MAC addresses that belong to our IGMP messages. You're going to notice in this example 01005E has two interfaces. 00 and gig 02. That lets us know that they belong to a multicast group. Basically in this figure, workstation A and workstation C are sending IGMP messages to join 239.255.11, which will translate to the multicast MAC address, the layer 2 address, 01005E, and the remaining 23 bits 7F0101. So switch one has snooping enabled, and this will populate the MAC address table with that information. Here's an example of, again, looking at how our switch one. So switch one will receive the traffic and it will forward it out only to gig00 and gig02. Because Gig01 and Gig03 are not participating in this multicast group. Thus, they will not receive that information. So a multicast static entry can also be used to manually program the MAC address table. But that's uh, a lot more in-depth than what you need. So now let's look at our PIM. Protocol Independent Multicast. A multicast routing protocol, which is necessary to route the needed multicast traffic throughout the network so that routers can locate and request these streams from other routers. Multicast routing protocol exists, but Cisco fully supports only PIM. Cisco just does it the Cisco M. PIM is a multicast routing protocol that routes multicast traffic between a network and different segments. PIM can use any of the unicast routing protocols to identify the path between the source and the different receivers. Multicast routers will create a distribution tree, an MTD, multicast distribution tree, that will define the path that multicast traffic will follow through the network to reach each of the receivers. There are two types of multicast distribution trees. Again, MTD, it's a source tree or a shared tree. The source tree is the shortest path tree, SPT. The shared tree is the RINAV point tree or RPT. Source tree, shortest path, shared tree is the rendezvous point tree. So let's look at both of these trees a little bit more in depth. All right, so source tree. Source tree is a multicast distribution tree where the source is the root of the tree. So in this example, we have our multicast source, 239111. It has a LAN interface connecting to R1. From there, our R1 will feed into our different networks, R1 and 
goes into R3 and R2. R3 will feed into R4 and so forth. This will build a tree from the source to our receivers. So when this tree is built, it will use the shortest path. For this reason, it's referred to the shortest path. Tree, S-P-T. The forwarding states of the S-P-T are known in the notation of S and G. S, comma, G. Where S is the source of the stream and G is the multicast group address. So, in this figure, it will show us the SG notation to go from our multicast, again, source, comma, our group address. Our source is 10112, comma, our address 239.1.1.1. And that information will flow through all of the different networks. So R3 will get it, and it will also denote 10.1.1.2, comma, 239.1.1.1. Because again, that lets it know how to get back to the root of the tree, which will be our multicast source. So again, that's one form. Another form is shared tree. And this is a distribution tree where the root of the shared tree is not the source, but a router designated as the rendezvous point, RP. And the shared tree are also referred to as RP trees, the rendezvous point trees. So in this example, we have a multicast source one and two. We have multiple LAN addresses. And so we can see, going off of source 1, we can see our group address. But look at the structure, star, comma, group address. That is because the multicast traffic will be forwarded down the shared tree according to the group address. So the packets are addressed to regardless of the source address. So the following state will refer to as the notation star G, pronounced star comma G. So star comma 239, 1.1.1. And then from there, we will also then map out our stored information, which will be our 10.1.1.2 comma 239.1.1.1. As that feeds into other information, we will forward it to our rendezvous point, our RP, and there we will feed in our star comma 239.111 and then our two pieces of LAN information comma the group ID. So that is why we have 10.1.1.2 comma 239 comma sorry 239.1.1.1 and we have the second address from Multi, or so multicast source 2, which will be 10.2.2.2, comma, our group address of 239.1.1.1. So again, now we can be feeding that information, but what we're passing along is the shared tree information, the star, comma, 239.1.1.1. That is the information that we are sharing throughout the tree to our different receivers. So let's dive a little deeper in terminology because that is going to be an important part. So when we're looking at our a giant tree, we have things like our first hop redundancy protocols. We have our downstream, our upstreams, our multicast portions, our PIMs. Do you, understart, do you understand why the network documentation is becoming more and more important? As we're logically feeding information to and from our networks, the design of the network and how data flows through the network is becoming crucial. We have things like our shortest path tree, our last hop routers, our upstream PIMs, our uh, IGMP joins, uh, our stars. So there's a lot of terminology here that needs to be able to be documented so that you can quickly reference 
where their pieces of information are. Thus, if you are having an issue, have a quick way to reference to troubleshoot. So let's talk about operational modes. There are currently five PIM operational modes, PIM defense mode, sorry, PIM dense mode, PIM sparse mode, PIM sparse dense mode, PIM source specific multicasts, PIM bidirectional mode. So again, things like our dense mode and sparse mode are commonly referred to as any source multicasting, ASM. Again, a lot of terminology in this module. Multicast, is, is, it could be its own little specialty, and there are dedicated additional resources just to multicasting. So multicasting is pretty deep, and we're only going to get deeper into it. So we're going to dive into these operational modes. That way we can understand how PIM really functions. To do that, we need to understand the control messages first. There are 11 types of main control messages. Remember what the TTL is set to 1? That all pro uh, PIM control messages will use the protocol number 103. It uh, should be either unicast or multicast. The hello, uh, certain messages have certain timers. Things like the PIM hello message are sent by default every 30 seconds out each PIM enabled interface to learn about the neighbors. So now let's look at this. I'm going to grab my pen so we can actually dive into this. So our Type 0 is a hello message. It is sent to 224.0013, all PIM routers, and these will use the different protocols, our PIM SM, our PIM DM, our bidirectional PIM, and our SSM. We also have a register, which will go to all of our RP addresses via a unicast message, and that will only let us look at PIM SM. Register stop, again, that's going to be our first hop routers, also sent unicast, also only going to our PIM SM. We have our join and our pruning, that will also go to 224.0013, all PIM routers, and that's for our PIM SM, bidirectional PIM and SSM. We have our bootstrap, again, I'm not going to go through the rest of the chart, you guys can go through this, but when you're going through the list, look at the types. Five, uh, zero through five are important. Six, seven are not important. Eight, nine, and ten, they come back. So we're good with that. But recognize there are control messages. Understand there are default timers. Normally, we're only looking at the default timer for the hello message. But we do have additional messages, uh, timers, that are not just tied to hello. So let's look at our different types of modes. Here is our PIM DM. This will show the flood and prune operations of dense mode. Here we have our two multicast addresses. So our first multicast address will feed into our router going into R1. R1 is going to send it out all of its interfaces. R2 will pick it up, will send it out of its interfaces, except for the one it received it on. R3 will also then recognize it was getting one from R2 and from R1, so it will send it out R4 and R, uh, the receiver's interface. And then R4 will pick it up and will, re uh, will not send it out it received it here. It will send out its LAN interface, but recognizing it won't have any receivers. So a packet may arrive via the non-RPF interface. So here, this is going to be the non-RFP interface. The multicast traffic from the source flooding throughout the entire network as each of the routers receive it via the RFP. It will forward the multicast uh, traffic through all of its 
diem neighbors. This results in some traffic arriving via non-RFP-based ports. As in this case, that's going to be the R3 receiving from R2 out of its non-RFP interface. So when we're talking our pruning messages, pruning messages are going to be things that don't have receivers. So our no receiver area will send a prune message. Our interface where we received our non-RFP will soon uh, send a prune message. If there are no receivers on R2, it will send a prune message. That way we could be pruning out information. So again, still in dense mode. This will il illustrate the resulting topology change after unnecessary links have been pruned off. As we go through this, we will have our multimedia source that will feed our source and our group address. So our S and G will be sent. No receivers, no receivers. So we'll just go straight down. PIM DM is not generally recommended for production environments. So normally this is for internal testing, not production, but it's one of, one of the modes. We also have our next PIM mode, known as sparse mode. This was designed for receivers scattered throughout the network, but work well in densely populated networks. There are some assumptions. There, basically, the assumption is that no receivers are interested in multicast traffic unless they explicitly request it. That means things won't randomly try to join unless they want to actually join. So just like PIMDM, sparse mode will use unicast routing cables to perform the RFP checking. And it doesn't care which routing protocol will populate the routing table. Our sparse mode will use an explicit join model where the receivers send a IGMP join to their local connected router. This will be known as the last hop router. And this join causes the last hop router, LHR, to send PIM joins in the direction of the root of the tree, which is either the RP, in the case of the shared RPT, or the first hop router, FHR, where the source transmitting the multicast streams are connected based off of the SPT. You notice you're not going to get away from these acronyms. So as we go through them, I would suggest rewatching, going through, writing a small little blurb for each of the acronyms. Moving forward, a multicast forwarding state will be created as a result of the explicit joins. Very different from flooding and pruning behavior of our PIM DM. So let's dive a little bit deeper into this. So here's an example. In this figure, we're going to illustrate a multicast source sending traffic to the FHR. <laughs> then we'll send it, this multicast traffic to the RP, which will make the multicast source to the unknown uh, to the RP. It will also illustrate the receiver sending the IGMP join to the LHR to join the group. So let's like work through this. Let me grab my pin. Perfect. All right. So first and foremost, we're gonna I'm gonna draw the line. Multicast source. Our first hop. FHR is the first router coming from the multicast source. Our last hop, LHR, is the item closest to our receivers. R3 has the receiver, R4 does not. So R4 in this area, we're just going to go ahead and ignore. 
So when we're going through here, our join, IGMP join, will be sent going forward. R3 will receive it. R3 will then try to process it. Depending on the type of mechanism that we have, R2 has been be given our rendezvous point, RP. So R3 will receive our IGMP join instructions. R3 will forward it to R2. R1 will also do our registration tunnel, some type of PIM uh, registration tunnel. So it will tunnel between R1 and R2. R2 will also get it. R2 will then take the registration tunnel that it received and it will funnel all of the join messages it gets back to R1. So R2, as it is designated our RP, will get it and then process it. So there's some information here. I'm going to go ahead and erase everything. The LHR, last hop router, then will send a PIM join. So going this way, that will be our star, comma, our group address to the RP. This forms the shared tree from the RP to the LHR. This is going to be our shared tree. The RP will then send a PIM join s comma g to the first hop router so it will send our sg this way to r1 forming a source tree between the source and the rp in essence two trees are created an spt and a shared tree so let's work through this. The SPT uh, is for the first hop router protocol and the RP. So in this area, this is going to be our SPT. And a shared tree here as well. So here is our SPT. And here is also our SPT. So here is our PIM spare switchover mode. So slightly different. Within our PIM SM, this will allow the LHR to switch from the shared tree to an SPT tree for a specific source. In our physical routers, the default behavior, and it happens immediately after the first multicast packet, is received from the RP via the shared tree. Even if the shortest path, shortest path tree, SPT, to the source through the RP. Again, half of the acronyms. In this figure, we're going to illustrate the shortest path tree switchover concept when the last hop router receives the first multicast packet from the RP and becomes aware of the IP address of the multicast source. Again, there we go. Our multicast feeds into our first hop router protocol. That will then feed into R2. So R2 is getting our multicast packets. R2 is our Rendezvous point, R2 will forward that out to R3. R3 will send it to the receiver, but R3 now knows the IP address of our multicast. So instead of sending it back to R2, R3 could send it back up to R1. 
That means the connection between R3 and R2 will be pruned. Because R3 is now fully aware, while RP does exist on R2, the shortest path up to our multicast source is through R1. We also have things like our designated router. When using multiple SM routers on a segment, PIM messages, specifically hello messages, are used to elect a designated router. That's going to be different than a designated router for a routing protocol. So also keep that in mind. Just like you'd expect, the designated router becomes the main router. This is to avoid sending duplicate uh, multicast traffic into a LAN or to other RPs. By default, priority of the PIM router is going to be set to 1. You can always change it to become the designated router. If all routers have the same priority, then the highest IP address in the subnet will be used as the tiebreaker. Highest uh, priority value, sorry, priority value first, then highest IP address. Without a designated router, all last hop routers on the same network would have the capability or the structure to be sending out all the PIM joins upstream, which could result in duplicate multicast traffic arriving on the LAN. That would just lead to wasted traffic, wasted bandwidth, wasted resources. The default designated router hold time is three and a half times the hello interval. If the hello interval is the default 30 seconds, then 3.5, three and a half times, it will be 105 seconds. If there are no hello intervals after the inter this interval, a new DR it would be elected. Typically, the DRs are automatically elected without our interference. You turn them on, routers do the election portion. To reduce DR fail over time, the hello query intervals can be reduced. You can manipulate our timers based off of your criteria. Remember that most timers have the ability to be modified for the network architect or the network uh, administrator to have better control of what's going on in their network. A reverse path forward, known as RPF, is the algorithm used to prevent loops and ensure that traffic is arriving on the correct interface. The RPFs function as these three main areas. Basically, if a router receives uh, multicast packets on a specific interface, it's used to send a unicast packet to the source. The packet should arrive on the RF RPF interface. Receiving it on a non-RFP interface should typically be pruned. If the packet arrives on that interface and a router forwards the packet out that interface, presenting in the outgoing interface list <laughs> OIL oil, of a multicast routing table entry. If the packet does not arrive on that same interface, the packet is discarded to prevent loops. PIMSM uses the RPF lookup function to determine whether it needs to send a join or prunes. Again, we're looking at source or S comma G, join are sent towards the source, or star comma G, the joins, i.e. the shared tree state, aren't sent towards the rendezvous point. We also have PIM forwarders. In this example, we are looking at PIM uh, DM that would be sending duplicates follow, uh, flows into a LAN. For this example, assuming that R1 is the RP, when R4 sends a PIM join message upstream towards it, it will send it to all PIM routers using the 224.0.0.13 and both R2 and R3 receives it. 
One of the fields of the PIM join message will include the IP address of the upstream neighbor, the RPF neighbor. Assuming that R3 is the RFP neighbor, R3 is the only one that will send the PIM joined R1. Even though as it's being fed up, the PIM may also go to R2 because R3 is identified as the RPF neighbor, then it will use that as the reason to feed information back to R1. R2 will not because the PIM join was not meant for it. At this point, the shared tree exists between R1, R3, and R4, and no traffic duplicate will then exist. So basically, the connection between R4 and R2 should be pruned. That way, we don't have duplicate information. Our rendezvous points, basically within our PIMSM, it's mandatory to choose one or more routers to operate as the rendezvous point. The rendezvous point is a single common root place at a chosen point of a shared distribution tree that was described earlier. The PIM router can be configured to function as the RP, either statically in each router and within the multicast domain or dynamically by configuring auto RP or basically the PIM bootstrap router, BSR, as described in the next section. So static RP, basically, this just provides the ability to statically configure the RP for the multicast group. If the network does not have different RPs defined, or if the RPs don't change very often, this could be a simple method. However, static configuration can increase administrative overhead, and the larger the network, the more complex it gets. If manually configured RP fails, there's no failover procedure. It just doesn't work. In contrast, we have an auto RP. It's a Cisco proprietary mechanism. It's easy to use in multiple RP networks. It allows load splitting. It simplifies RP placement. It prevents inconsistency manual static RP configuration that might cause problems. However, multiple RPs can also be used to serve different group ranges and also serve as backups. The auto RP mechanism does operate using two basic component candidate RPs, CRPs, and RP mapping agents, or MAs. So why don't we all use uh, auto, RP, auto RPs? Mainly because it's Cisco proprietary. The mechanism is focused on Cisco technologies. If you have a vendor agnostic network, this may not work for you. So now let's look at R, sorry, CRPs better and RP mapping agents or MAs. The CRPs will advertise its willingness to be an RP via the announcement message at using the reserved well-known multicast group of 2240139. That's the Cisco RP announcement. The announcement will contain the default group range 2240000/4. These CRP addresses and hold timers which is three times the RP announcement interval. If there are multiple CRPs, the one with the highest address is preferred. The mapping agents or MAs will join the group 2240139 to receive the announcements. They will store the information contained within the announcements in a group to RP mapping cache along with holding timers. If multiple RPs advertisements the same group range, the CRP with the highest address is then elected. The MAs will advertise the RP mapping to other well-known multicast group addresses using the 2240140 address, i.e. the Cisco RP Discovery pro uh, address protocol. These messages are advertised by default every 30, sorry, every 60 seconds. 
so it's twice as long as the traditional 30 sec timer it can also advertise it when changes are detected the ma announcements will contain the elected rp as well as the grouped rp mapping all pim enabled routers will join the 2240140 network and store the rp mapping in their private cache again this is one avenue we could also use our bootstrap if necessary so let's look at our bootstrap our bootstrap router it also known as our bsr will have a mechanism as described as rfc 5059 it's a non-private non-proprietary mechanism to allow for fault tolerance and a little bit better scalability it will automate the rp discovery and distribution mechanism pims use the bsr to discover and announce different rp as well as set information for each group and each group prefix to all of the routers in the pim domain this is the same function accomplished by the auto rp but the BSR is part of the PIM v2 specification. The RP set is a grouped RP mapping that contains things like the multicast group range, the RP priority, the RP addresses, the hash of the mask length, and the SM or bidirectional flags that are necessary. We also have things like our candidate RPs as they relate to the BSR. So in this example, we have our BSR mechanism where the elected BSR will receive the candidate RP advertisement messages from all of the candidates within the domain. And then it sends the BSR messages with RP set information out all the PIM enabled interfaces and it will flood hop by hop to all routers on the network. Again, the act of BSR will store all incoming CRP message advertisements in its grouped RP mapping cache held in private memory. The BSR messages are sent every 60 seconds by default to all PIM routers in the entire network. As the routers receive copies of these BSR messages, they update their local information and they'll also update their local group to RP mapping cache. And this allows them to have full visibility of the IP addresses for all CRPs addresses in the network. All right, that is it for this chapter. Key topics for this are things like multicast fundamentals, IP uh, multicast addressing, well-known reserve multicasting, layer two multicast addressing, how our IGMP descriptions work, IGM, IGMP v2, IGMP v3, message formatting and operations, our snooping tools, our PIM definition, our tree definitions, both source and shared, the different terminologies, operational modes, control message and control message types, our PIM operational modes like DM, SM, SM shared, SM source, SMFPT switchover, SM designated routers, our RFP definitions and our forwarders, our rendezvous point definitions, our different forms of rendezvous, static and auto, auto RP and our CRPs, our auto RP mapping to agents, our PIM BSR definitions, as well as our BSM CRP definitions. And again, our forwarding information, our states, our incoming and outgoing interfaces, our oils, our snooping, our first hop, our last hop, our rendezvous points, our upstream, our downstream, our tree types, shortest path, our rendezvous points and those are the main key terms so that is the end of this chapter thank you all right so that wraps up this 
module. If you have any questions or concerns, definitely feel free to reach out, post a comment, ask a question. Remember, as we're going through this material, it's common to be able to take some time, gather your thoughts, ask some questions so that we can really work on retention and getting you more familiar with the material. Thank you.